Perfect. Okay, I guess everyone is in now. Um, good. Welcome everyone to one, uh, one more webinar. Uh, we are happy to have you here. So, you know, this webinar is presented by NEWRET. We're an FMUS manufacturer and it, we are always focusing on innovation and what's new out there. Um, in this webinar, we're we are having um, the pleasure to have Dr. Ted Huppert here and we will talk about image reconstruction. So it will explain a little bit about the algorithms. How do you do it from more a theoretical perspective and also how this is uh, done using the brain analyzer toolbox. Um, before we start, um, we have here, um, I'll be presenting, and then we have um, moderator also, Amy and Alina in the background that make everything happen. And um, some considerations before we move on, you're all muted. Questions are welcome at any time. Please use the Zoom panel. Uh, we will address the questions uh, at the end. And all this content, uh, as usual, will be available in our website. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, don't hesitate to send us an email at consulting at neurex.net. Good. So we'll present now our host uh, for the, the afternoon here in Berlin, I guess morning there uh, in Pittsburgh, Dr. Ted Huppert. Uh, he's associate professor in radio radiology in secondary appointments in bio bioengineering, clinical translation science in the center of neural basis of cognition. He's a core faculty uh, member of the UPMC Magnetic Re Resonance Research Center. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And has authored more than 65 peer review publications in brain image methodology, including NIRS, uh, MAG, MRI, and multimodal methods. And he's also one of the founding members of the Society for F NIRS. Um, Dr. Ted Huppert, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll have to have you guys update that slide a little bit because I've changed my affiliation slightly. So let me show my screen. Okay, so you can, oops. See, so, uh, we can see the screen. Okay. Are we good? Yep. Okay. Yes. So uh, so, so as mentioned, so I'm 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 Ted Huppert. I'm um, I'm actually now at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but still at the University of Pittsburgh, um, where we run the NEARS lab. I've been here for I don't know since 2007, um, and uh, we work on mostly method development. We work with a lot of users here at Pitt, and then through Neurax and and around the country to basically help them do the analysis. So what I'm going to talk today about is a little bit tricky topic. It's the topic of image reconstruction. I apologize in advance. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of text on a lot of these slides. I will try to make it as less painful as possible as we go through here, because I really want you to understand, not necessarily that you should remember uh, the equation for maximum likelihood, but that you understand why we do maximum likelihood and what the, the different um, trade-offs are and what the limitations are in interpreting image reconstruction data. Okay, so as an overview, uh, I'm first introduced the problem, this inverse problem that we talk about, which is a problem. So I'm gonna talk about what some of the limitations of that are and, and introduce that. And then I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna jump ahead to show you exactly how we solve this in the toolbox what the function is. Um, that function has a bunch of parameters. And so I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk talking about the math behind some of those parameters. I'm gonna talk about what's called hierarchical Bayes priors, um, how we do group level analysis in, in imagery construction, and then how we do things like spatial smoothing and surface wavelets within there. Hopefully I have time at the end, I wanna introduce some of the multimodal tools that we already have in the toolbox. Um, but I think um, given that I talk slow, I'm probably gonna run out of time to go much beyond that. Okay, so image reconstruction problem, right? So, so with NEARS, we measure individual source detector pairs. 
right? So we have these individual channels of data. Maybe we have 50, 100 channels or so on um, that are positioned around the head. The image reconstruction problem is how do you take that surface channel-based data and reconstruct something about the underlying brain? So we talk about the optical forward model, these banana functions um, that we see. Uh, let's see, let's see on the last. So, so you guys can see my mouse, right? Maybe. Um, yes. But we do. This, this optical forward model, right? We have a source position that's sending in the light. It diffuses through the tissue. It comes out, um, collecting it under one of the detectors. And this this banana shape defines the forward model, the sensitivity of that particular source detector pair to all the voxels underneath. Now, if the brain changed anywhere along this path, I would measure it as a change in my, my signal in channel space, my actual measurement, right? And if it's changing in a spot where I'm more sensitive, so let's say where it's redder here, right by the source, up near the surface of, of the scalp, my measure, the a smaller change is going to give a bigger, a smaller change in brain space is going to give a rather large change in channel space. If it's down, whoops, if it's down, whoa, if it's down deeper, deeper in the brain, then, you know, a bigger change in brain space is going to maybe give a smaller change in channel space. And so we've got this, this ill-posed problem. That is to say that ill-posed means that there's no unique solutions. So we could have had a, um, with a single channel of data, we could have a very small change in near the skin or a very large change in the brain, but we would have measured the exact same um, measurement. We wouldn't have been able to tell from our, our single measurement. When we start to throw in lots of source detector pairs, we can start to get some information about where this occurred, but we still have this inherently ill-posed problem that there's multiple solutions that would have given us the same set of data, the same measurements. And so picking out which of those multiple solutions are the most valid, uh, they all fit the data, but we have to define valid in some way. Maybe it's what we expected the signal to look like. Maybe it's oxy went up and deoxy went down. That's an expectation, that's a prior. And so we have to somehow introduce that information because data alone is not sufficient to do this image reconstruction. The second problem with the reconstruction uh, process is that it's underdetermined. I have a lot more unknowns, voxels in the brain that I did measurements, right? Even with the fanciest mirrors equipment out there, you might measure several hundred, maybe a thousand source detector pairs, but you still have you know, an order of magnitude more voxels in the brain, depending on your spatial resolution. So, so typically we have a lot more unknowns than we do measurements. Um, and another problem of this is that it's ill-conditioned, which means that um, our Ford model, when we plot out that banana function, it spans several orders of magnitude. That banana is plotted out in log space, which means that I have to accommodate changes that are both really big and really small. Um, and so you start to run into numerical precision errors, right? It's, it's if you want to model something that's, you know, has a really big dynamic range, you have to use a higher mo uh, numeric model order and, and stuff like that. So rounding issues become important um, and, and things like that. So let's take a look at a simple problem with this. Um, we have an inverse model here, y equals h times beta. Y is my measurements, it's my set of, of channel measurements. And so let's say I have three measurements, three, five, and seven right here on the, oops. I'm having trouble because my mouse and cursor is way over there, but my camera is over here. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to coordinate. Um, but anyway, so, so we have three measurements. In this case, it's just a simple toy problem, three, five, and seven. H is my forward model, right? It's my, my mesh. So I just, just made something up you know, this, this matrix here in, 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 in here. And then I've got the three unknowns that I want to measure, A, B, C. So this, this actually isn't underdetermined. I have three unknowns and three measurements. So that's not a problem. But the problem is that this, this equation is actually ill-posed, which, which means that I can, when I go and I try to go through the algebra here, 
you'll be able to see that A is one. There's only one solution that works uh, for A. It has to be one, right, for this, this set of equations, this linear set of equations. But actually, the way that I wrote this out, there's an infinite number of solutions. Anytime that B plus C equals two, it's a valid solution to this problem, right? So if I told you the answer was three, five, and seven, that's what you measured, you'd be able to say, hey, I, I know A is one, but I have no idea what B and C are, right? Because the data was not sufficient to constrain that, okay? So the idea, that's that idea of being ill-posed. You have multiple unique solutions. So the solution to that is to introduce some additional information into my cost function, add some additional prior that I think is true about my, 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 my system, my image. So very often times you might use something simple like beta is small and it's maybe close to zero um, or that it's positive. It's, I'm not gonna allow negative numbers. And so what you do is you have this part of my cost function that is, I want to fit the data. I want to find the beta that best predicts my measurements. But then you add to it, you extend the cost function with this object, this, this uh, regularization part, which can be literally anything. It's something that you know about the system that you want to use to constrain that image. So we might say something like, like we're gonna pick this one, that beta is really close to some prior expectation of beta, right? And so we're gonna to try to find the beta that, min that fits the data, but is also um, not too far off from this, right? Not too far off from beta not my initial, my, uh, initial prior. Um, and we've got this term lambda, it's what's called a hyperparameter. And it basically adjusts those two parts of the model. If lambda is really small, the only thing that matters was the data. And we knew that was not sufficient. If lambda is really big, right, then this penalty term is so important that it really doesn't even matter what the data is. I'm gonna choose a beta that looks like beta naught, right? And somewhere in between is that happy medium in that you're trusting some of your data and you're trusting some of your prior information. And the idea with regularization is we can extend this. So we, can, we don't have to stop at just one function. We can add lots of functions and lots of lambdas, but it becomes a problem of, well, how did you know lambda, right? I, could, I, I have to pick lambda, um, which adjusts between these two. So let's take a look at that. Um, let's go back to this problem. Let's pick a simple lambda like this of, I want to minimize, I want to fit the data, but I want to use the smallest numbers possible to do it. Right. I don't want, I know that B plus C has to equal two. So a valid solution was 1,000 and negative one or 1,002 and negative 1,000. That adds up to two, but it's just two really big numbers that just cancel each other. So the idea with this prior, what's, what's called the minimum norm prior, um, this one has a kind of a special name for this, this is I want to solve with beta that is small. So I don't want that 1,002 and negative 1,000 to be a valid solution. I, I don't, that doesn't seem to make sense, but one and one would be okay. And I'd be okay with two and zero and zero and two and maybe three and negative one, but I'm not as keen on that one. That's what Lambda is doing, is it's, 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 it's mathematically trying to constrain and add that information about that you expect it to be close to this, close to zero in this case. And so if you see what happens, this is a plot of lambda versus those two parameters, right? So we see that um, if lambda is too small, I have to trust, I'm, I'm not giving it enough information. The data alone was not enough information. So you get these solutions of a thousand and negative 998, and that adds up to two or a million and negative a million, whatever. So you get these big solutions that just goes off the chart high. You go through a period of time in which you reasonably get a stable estimate, right? Those 
one and you know one plus one equals two and three minus one equals two and, and so on those solutions uh, start to, to become uh, are, are, are stable oops and then as you make lambda too large what happens is it starts to ignore the actual data and you see this because now a the blue line here which we knew was one right we could uniquely solve for it now because I'm trusting that this regularization is more important than my data itself, now A starts to even go to zero. And you start to crush everything, even the stuff that you knew with confidence uh, from the measurements alone. So this is the problem with regularization is how do you pick this, this term? How do you pick this, this lambda? Okay. And that, that's kind of the whole, um, in a nutshell, that's the essence of the inverse problem is my data is not sufficient. So I have to find ways to solve this problem. So if it's ill-posed, we can add a new cost function. We can extend it with extra information that we know about the system. If it's underdetermined, we can find a way to reparameterize it. We can spatially smooth so that we're, 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 we're getting smoother solutions with less degrees of freedom. Um, we can do a change in, in basis set using PCA or something like that to reparameterize the model. And then ill condition, that's a more of a mathematical computer science thing. We just have to rescale the model appropriately so that things converge and we don't have rounding errors and, and, and so on. So what we do in the nearest toolbox is we have a module right now that's called nearest.modules.imagerecon.mfx. Mixed effects is what MFX stands for. Um, and basically this, if you were to, 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 to say, you know, job equals nearest.modules image recon, you would see that that job has a number of parameters. Um, so it has a couple of parameters and I'm gonna briefly introduce this here, but then I'm gonna go through step-by-step -step what each of these, these actually, um, uh, mean mathematically. So the first set of parameters it has are related to the mixed effects model. So when we do image reconstruction, we have found that it's actually better to use all of your data and not to do, an, well, you can do an image reconstruction on just one subject, but we actually do our image reconstruction using all the subjects together so that it's kind of a combined group average and image reconstruction model. And you'll see why we do that as I go through the later slides. But I just want to point out the first couple of parameters, they're really related to that mixed effects part, right? What formula am I going to use for the mixed effects model? Uh, so in this case, I have a parameter called um, group um, and subject, and I'm treating subject as a random variable and group as a covariate of interest. Um, we can, you can put in age and so on. Anything the mixed effects model at the group level can take, so can the image recon. The second set of parameters here, we have related to that four model. I have to tell you, in order to do reconstruction, I have to tell you where the probe was, and I have to tell you where, how sensitive those measurements were to the underlying tissue, so the, the Jacobian. Um, so you specify that in there. And then again, we're going to talk about that more. And then we have methods in there to allow smoothing, to allow reduction of the degrees of freedom to reparameterize the model. So whether that's a spatial Gaussian smoothing or a wavelet model, which will make sense again later on in the talk. Um, and then finally, we have the ability to put in additional priors. So we can put in that prior of, hey, I expect beta to be really close to zero, but, and have a lambda associated with that. But we can also put in priors, hey, I expect it to be close to zero, but I read this one paper in fMRI and said it should be in the motor cortex. And so I wanna use that as a prior too. Well, you can, you can extend your cost function, add another Lambda to it and say, I want it to be zero, but I also want it to look like this MRI data. That is, I expect it to be in this region of interest or something. And I have a Lambda associated with that. And so I'm gonna show you how to you do that through this uh, priors variable in, in, in the model, okay? So let's, let's walk through a little bit of an example. Um, so the first step, if you wanna do image reconstruction is you do all the pre-processing up through optical density. 
or really what you do is you do stats in optical density. So you might um, load up your NIRX data, which is already registered. Uh, so you load it up and you have a registered 3D probe that if you say probe.draw is gonna draw on the surface of the brain, et cetera. So it's already registered to the anatomy. Um, there was a lecture, a webinar I gave a while ago, maybe six months, a year ago on image reg on registration. And so I'm not gonna cover that here. But that is to say you have a probe that's registered to the brain, to a brain. Um, so what you do is you take that data, you convert it to optical density, you'd run a stats model, so GLM or something, you might do, you know, TDDR or something for motion correction or, you know, PCA or whatever your favorite filters are. Um, and then, but at the end of the day, I, I'm going to want the stats variable in optical density. And that's what's going to feed into my image reconstruction model. So why do we use stat? Why do we use optical density? Why don't we go to Beer Lambert law? So the reason we use optical density rather than hemoglobin is because light diffusing through the, the brain doesn't cares about what wavelength you're at, not whether or not you're talking oxy deoxy. So the optical forward model is actually these A matrices are wavelength specific. So what we do is if we want to reconstruct oxy deoxy, we take our data in optical density space, we take our A matrices, our banana functions in wavelength space, but then we have embedded in here these coefficients, um, which are the same ones, the extinction coefficients that you would use for the Beer Lambert law. So basically, this image reconstruction is doing both the Beer Lambert law and the image reconstruction at the same time. So it's going from optical density to oxy deoxy concentration. But the, the problem is I can't give it oxy deoxy over here because I would have trouble defining the wavelength. Like what wavelength is oxy hemoglobin? It's a combination of all of them. So you, you need to be in optical density when you're feeding into my imagery construction code. Now we do have a couple of tools that um, can, can make things a little bit more consistent. So you can um, run the Beer Lambert law on the stats variable. So if you run the GLM on optical density to get stats, your statistical map in optical density in channel space, you can use that for the image reconstruction, but you probably wanted a map in channel space too. Um, and so you can actually convert that stats variable in optical density to hemoglobin using the same Beer Lambert module. It's got a little flag in there that says, did you give me time series data or did you give me a stats variable or did you give me a region of interest variable or, or whatever? And it'll figure out um, what model to use appropriately. Um, another thing is um, if you have stats in hemoglobin already, so you, instead of following my advice and you actually went to stats in hemoglobin up here, um, I have a module, it's not in the public release yet. I'll, I'll put it there uh, very shortly. Um, but it basically goes the other way of take the stats in hemoglobin and turn it back to optical density because that's what the imagery construction model wants. Um, this just avoids running the GLM model twice um, and make sure that your data is self-consistent. Um, the GLM model, because there's some random number generating in terms of um, some of the iterations and stuff like that, um, it, it, it's not, in, it's reasonably deterministic. Uh, you run it multiple times, you'll get the same answer, but maybe not the ninth decimal place in the same answer. And so doing it this way just kind of makes sure that you have a completely self-consistent model. Um, anyway, so first step, compute optical stats and optical density. Step number two is going to be to compute the optical forward model. Now, given the head, so I need a model of the head, and I need a... Um, program to solve, to calculate where the photons went. Um, and I need to know the probe registration. So if we look at this, we have, uh, so this, this, this kind of pseudo code here, you would create a forward model, you would create a solver, you would tell that solver where the probe is, you would tell that solver what properties you want to use, and you would tell that solver what the mesh is, what the head or brain model is, and then you would say, solve it. Say, so give me the Jacobian and you would return the Jacobian, all right? So the first line of this, this code 
what it does is it defines which program we want to use to solve the optical forward model. Okay. So right now there's five programs that we've coded up essentially wrappers to. None of these, well, the first one is mine, but the other two, uh, MC, M, MMC and M, MCX are both written by Chin Chin Fang, who's at Northeastern University. Nearfast and Nearfast BEM are written by Hamid Dagani, who's at Exeter, I think. Um, I'm sorry if Hamid's on here, that I don't remember where he's, where he moved to. Um, but basically there, there's trade-offs to these. So the first one, kind of the default, is what we call the approximate slab model. This is a horrible model from an engineering standpoint, but it's fast. What it does is basically assumes the head is a slab, a flat surface with no structure and homogeneous properties and computes the optical forward model for that. So if you have a probe, a source detector, you basically have two slabs and that's how it's modeling it. It's a terrible solution to high order. But it's perfectly fine if you want to kind of do something quick. Uh, when you run these more proper solutions, usually the answer doesn't change all that much. Might change, you know, from uh, you know uh, a value of one to a value of one and a half. But it's it shouldn't go from a positive brain area, you know, positive activity in the motor cortex to a negative activity in dorsolateral prefrontal. It, it shouldn't change the story very much. Um, but the advantage of the approximate slab is it's really, really fast, under a second to run. The downside is it's not a proper Ford model. The two methods, MC, uh, MMC lab and MCX lab, are both Monte Carlo methods. So that is, they actually solve the radiative transport equation, which is how does light diffuse, how does light go through the tissue, right? Um, I use, accidentally used the term diffuse because diffuse is actually an approximation. Light doesn't truly diffuse. It actually has, a, especially at the CSF layer and stuff like that, it has a little bit of ballistic. It's not entirely isotropic in especially layers like the CSF. And so that's what the radiative transport equation solves is the radiative transport equation kind of solves the real model. Um, so these are proper solutions. They do better with layers like CSF, um, where it's optically clear and kind of that diffusion model breaks down a little bit. The downside is these are really slow. So to run Monte Carlo simulations, you might send in 10 to the ninth photons through your computer simulation. And that might take you an hour or, well, that, that might take you several hours to solve the whole thing. So it's co very computationally intensive. MC X is a GPU version. It's faster, but it's a lot faster, but you have to have GPUs now. Um, uh, whereas MC, MMC is a, um, is a CPU based version. Nearfast and Nearfast BEM are both diffusion approximation solvers. So I said that the radiative transport equation models the correct solution. It models that light doesn't entirely diffuse. It doesn't scatter isotropically in something like CSF. It actually has, um, it, it, has, it goes a little bit ballistic. It still scatters, but it has a directionality to it um, in layers like CSF. The diffusion approximation says that basically scattering events are isotropic. So each time you take a scatter, you pick a direction and kind of randomly walk into that, at least at first order. Uh, um, you can add second order or higher order terms that try to constrain it a little bit and add more information about that, the cone in which your scattering goes. Um, but, and as you add more and more higher order terms, you become a better solution, particularly in layers like the CSF. But um, that's what near fast and near fast BEM does is it solves the finite element version of that diffusion approximation. Reasonably good, it runs, it, uh, you don't expect a very big solution uh, difference compared to the Monte Carlo methods. Um, so whether or not it's actually worth doing Monte Carlo versus um, find an element is really kind of, if you were trying to model baseline properties and trying to really get information about the CSF, so maybe you had a study that was, you know, what is the effect of brain atrophy and this extra CSF layer in aging? And how does that affect NEARS? You'd probably, I'm going to use Monte Carlo on 
But if you're just doing an imagery construction and you don't really care about CSF, maybe you don't even have the anatomy for that subject, finite element modeling is faster and, and plenty sufficient. So near fast can run in minutes. The BEM version can run a little bit faster. I'm not sure if Hammett still uh, supports the BEM uh, version. I don't, I didn't see it on his website the last time. So he might've discontinued supporting that. Anyway, so basically the first step of the inverse model, you pick which of these five models do we wanna run, right? So I'm gonna start with the approximate slab. The, the inputs are actually all exactly the same from the step on. So this first line, said, I want to use the approximate slab as my solver. The second line says, okay, I'm going to give it the probe. So here's my 3D registered probe. Here's where my sensors were and what measurements I care about. The next step is we need to give it a, its optical properties. So in the approximate slab, you only get one property. It's homogeneous slab. So we'd specify what optical properties we want to use for that. So Nearest.media defines our ways to define optical properties. So there's a nearest.media.tissues. And inside of tissues, there's preloaded parameters for bone, skin, um, brain, and, and water CSF. OK, so, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying I want to use the, the standard parameters for the brain at these two wavelengths, um, and then this 0.7 and 50 are the baseline oxygen saturation and the baseline uh, blood volume. Um, but you can leave those off and, and they have default values. Those are actually the default values. And what that will do is that it will return something that looks like this that tells me, okay, in the brain, this is what you expected at those two wavelengths. This is what you expected mu A and mu S and, and the speed of light and, and so on to, to be. Um, it's based on uh, it's, the references, uh, uh, Stephen Jacques, uh, uh, well, that paper came out 2018, 2017-ish paper um, that really compiled a lot of these, these parameters. Um, the tissue models return what's called a, a spectral property um, class. And basically, these, this class, what you do is you change red is the um, fields you can edit, and black is actually the read-only fields. So in the spectral properties class, I can change hemoglobin or water content or lipid content, and it'll update what you expect the mu A and mu S to be based on that. So, so you enter these parameters here, and then it uses an equation from that, that Jacques paper to figure out what mu A and mu S would have, would have been. So for example, oxy, deoxy down here are not free parameters. I specify oxygen saturation, and total hemoglobin, and I know 0.7 times 50 must be 35, right? So if I change it up here, it changes it down here, but I can't edit this one directly, okay? These are read-only, black are read-only. The other, inside the nearest.media, there's another class called optical properties. This one, you edit directly. So you edit mu A directly rather than changing oxy deoxy. Uh, so depending on what you know, um, whether you want to, um, put in the values directly, or you want to model it based on a tissue, um, uh, you can put it, you can specify properties that can be either one of these. If you had a model that had different layers, like a finite element or the boundary element model, or the ones that are near fast is going to use, um, you, you're going to specify a property for each of the tissue regions. So for the skin, the CSF, the brain, et cetera, separately. Um, because we're using the approximate slab model, which only takes one property, I only have to give it one, and I chose the brain uh, for this. Finally, what we do is we give it a mesh. We give our forward model a, a mesh to solve with, and that tells me, what, you know, where do I want to compute this? What are the properties of there? So the mesh that you define um, is basically kind of the head anatomy. So we have a number of different ways to define that mesh. So, well, actually, sorry, I'm, I've skipped ahead to the next slide. Um, so, so that mesh is either going to be a finite element model, that is, it's a bunch of tetrahedrals that define the entire volume. Um, that's what uh, NearFast uses. That's what these MCX and MCC, MMC models use, is they need meshes. Um, when we load the data in from either directly from a NIRX 
um, or we load up our Colin 27 Atlas, we actually, what I store in the toolbox is actually boundary elements. So I store, here's the surface of the brain, here's the surface of the skin, but that brain, in order for uh, NearFast to work, you actually have to create a, you have to interconnect everything inside that volume too. It's not just a surface, not just a boundary. And so um, if you load in your data from NearX or you load in a boundary element model, like the Colin 27 one that we have here, you have to use this additional step called, you know, bem.convert to FEM. And basically what we do is we load up the model from Nearfax, Near, uh, sorry, from Nearx, and then we would compute this model that would change it over into a finite element from a boundary element to a finite element. I think there's an opposite one of if I have a finite element, I can convert it to a boundary element model. Um, it's using behind the scenes, it's using this program called ISO to mesh that you have to install separately. So the first time you run this, if you don't have ISO to mesh, it gives you instructions on where to download it from. Um, you can also use either on the finite element or the boundary element, there's a command called reduce mesh, um, which um, prunes it. So say I had a one millimeter mesh and I wanna bring it down to five millimeters, um, I can use this, which will which will cut it by 80%, so down to 20% of the original. Um, and you can adjust that to kind of, the more, um, the finer the resolution mesh, the sort of better your solution's gonna be, but the more unknowns you're gonna have in the model when you try to solve this thing and the longer it's gonna to take to run computationally. And so it's this trade-off of, you know, how long do you want to, how patient are you? And, you know, how accurate do you want your solution to be? And I tend to not have very much patience. Um, um, and just to kind of show, there's another one that'll convert the mesh to like a nifty style image. So it actually make a three, you know, this is the brain mesh I used. It'll actually reconstruct it into a volume, um, like an MRI type image. Okay. So, so, depending on which solver you use, you have to use the appropriate mesh. So it either needs to be a boundary element or a finite element model. Um, I think, knock on wood, oh, knock on this is, I think that if you give near fast a boundary element model, it'll automatically convert to finite element. Um, that says, hey, you gave me the wrong version and it'll, it'll smart enough to figure out which one you actually meant. Um, but I don't entirely, I'm not entirely sure on that statement. Um, but just be aware they're using two different types of models within there, depending on which forward model solver you're using. And then where that mesh came from, um, we can actually customize. So yeah, we could use the Colin 27 or the one that, you know, is the default for the NEREX systems, but maybe I actually have a structural MRI for that subject, or maybe I have an atlas that is age, more age appropriate for my subject. So we can actually, in that mesh space, we can use whatever you're able to give me. Um, right now, a lot of this is coded up of, you know, kind of specific to what my lab has done. Um, and I know we have some problems with like FreeSurfer that, you know, someone will say, hey, I'm not using the same version of FreeSurfer or this field doesn't exist anymore. And it turns out that that field was, I was using a different version of FreeSurfer. I did something extra, had a flag that was different. Um, so we're working on trying to make this more general. If you run into problems with this, contact me and we'll try to, to fix it. Um, but right now we can read in data from FreeSurfer. So you can take FreeSurfer, you can take your structural MRI, your T1 weighted, um, segment it into the different tissue into the brain regions. Um, and then if you run this, this, um, uh, this, this command read free surfer and point to the subjects directory, what it'll do is it'll look at that free surfer directory. If you haven't already run this step in your free surfer, it'll run it for you. And what it is, is it's what's called the watershed algorithm. And it basically takes the, the everything that's not brain, the skin's called CSF, and it does a watershed to kind of label it. So you end up with labels of here's the skin, here's the skull, here's the, here's the, the CSF, and then the brain. And what this command nears.registration.readfreesurfer does is you point to your subject directory that was run in FreeSurfer, 
and it'll it'll pull in all the information from that and create the information if it's not there to create a boundary element model from your subject. Okay, so we can create individual ones. Um, there's another version of this um, uh, BEM um, uh, read uh, M and E B BEM model. So M and E um, is a tool for MAG EEG analysis. It's actually very tied into FreeSurfer. There's a Python version of it that that's now really popular. Um, and so in those models, those, those programs are creating boundary element models that those researchers want to use for EEG reconstruction. And because I'm lazy and didn't feel like reinventing the wheel, we just wrote wrappers that would read in. So you already know how to do this in EEG. We can read in exactly what you would have already done. So, so we have this uh, read m and &E boundary element model that reads in the one that was created by m and &E. um, Likewise, at the very end, skipping, we have, um, there's another program called Open M E uh, Open M E E G. Um, it's actually used by Brainstorm and Mirstorm. Um, and so we have a reader that does the same thing there that those people in EEG already figured out how to do boundary element models and we can just read in the model that they created. And then finally, we do have a, some code. I, I don't swear by it. Um, but we'll do the actual segmentation and read it in using SPM. Um, so if you give it a T1 rated uh, image, a nifty file, it'll actually run all the, the um, SPM code in order to create the skin, skull, brain models, and it'll feed that into the, 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 the toolbox. Um, so there's a number of different options uh, to specify individual anatomy that you want to use for the image reconstruction problem. Um, and then the last one here um, is basically the command of give me the Jacobian, give me the Ford solution. So, so you've, you see you've got this flag on here that says spectral. So if you don't give it that flag, uh, basically if you give that flag or not, there's two versions of the Ford model. The first one is the spectral that I already introduced that goes from optical density all the way down and reconstructs images of oxydeoxy. It's the combination of the Beer Lambert law and the image reconstruction process. If you don't give it kind of the traditional approach, um, um, was to use basically a wavelength dependent forward model, but then you're solving for an image that's wavelength dependent. So you get one image at one wavelength, another image at the other wavelength. You could put these together to get oxy deoxy hemoglobin as a second step, um, but the spectral prior does it all at, at once. Um, so generally, this is the one, the spectral prior one is the one that you, you probably want to use, um, but that's what that, that flag does, is it sets up which one you want to use. Okay, moving on. Um, so we've, we've processed our data to make our stats and optical density. We've set up this forward model based on my probe registration and the anatomy, and then we set up the processing job. And so we create the job, nearest.modules.imagerecon. We tell it the mesh that I want to reconstruct on. I tell it the probe. I tell it the Jacobian. I tell it the formula. And then we say job.run, and it creates the, 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 the stats on it. So we need to, um, with the reconstruction, although we can put in individual anatomy for the Jacobian, at the end of the day, I need a single mesh that I want to display things on. Right, so you pick one of your brains that you you want to show the results on, um, and and so this has to map on to whatever you use for the Jacobian, um, and it'll make more sense in a few slides. Um, but you have to specify the mesh that you want to show things on. The probe in the Jacobian fields are actually dictionaries. That is, they're special. You see, it says job dot probe of default equals. Um, so it, you can, if you put default, so this is the probe that, and the Jacobian that's gonna use, used for any subject that's not otherwise labeled. But if I actually had anatomy for Ted, I could say job.probe of Ted and give him the probe and, you know, Jacobian of Ted and it's Ted's specific uh, Ford model. And so 
what you can do then is that allows you to define a unique probe and a unique Jacobian for each subject. So if you knew the anatomy, you knew the probe registration was off, uh, you know, because you did a 3D localization or something like that, it could mean you have a different probe for each subject and a different Jacobian, but it's the same underlying mesh. We all want to reconstruct it onto, you know, the Colin Alice or something like that. Um, uh, and so this allows you to, to, to do that within the toolbox of specifying the probe and the Jacobian unique to any to all the subjects. Again, we're going to cover this. I'm, I'm spending more time than I intended on this right now, but oops, went the wrong way. Okay. Um, and so at the end of the day, you run, you say job.run, you get stats, and you get hopefully an image that looks hopefully better than, than this one. Um, but it's a image stats variable. That stats, the variable contains a, a mesh. So it has the information to draw itself. It contains the betas, that is the coefficients you estimated. There's the, the covariance of those. Um, degrees of freedom, probe, kind of all the things that you find in the standard channel space stats variable in my toolbox, uh, but this defines it in image space. So you can say image stats dot draw uh, like this, and it'll draw an image that looks like like this. Um, there, there's there's a couple of things that I just wanted to point out. So on the mesh, you can there's a field. Um, the mesh.fiducials is a table, which like say you have, here's my optodes or here's my 10, 20 points or whatever. Um, there's a field in there and that table that's called draw, it's true, false. And if you set it to true, it'll actually add that fiducial marker to your image. So if I wanted to make the same image and put all the 10, 20 points on it, I would go into this fiducials variable and I change those 10, 20 points to true. Or if I only wanted to put a subset of them on there, I would change only that subset to true, or if I wanted to put the optodes and so on. So you can control extra things that get drawn on your image with this, this fiducials field. Um, there's also a transparency field that controls how see-through the different layers of the brain are. With the, the, this model, I only have one layer, but if I had the finite element stuff where I have a skin, skull, CSF, et cetera, you might want the skin to be like see-through, and so you might set it to a transparency of like 10% so that you can, it's 90% it's, it's see-through. Um, or you might turn it off completely. So you'd say transparency equals zero, in which case it won't even draw it. You won't see it at all. So you can control the outer layers, whether or not you want to make them visible and stuff and control that visibility. That's this transparency. Um, the draw command I already kind of talked about, it's very similar to the stats dot draw, the channel space one, you say draw, you give it a range, uh, which is either empty set or say, I want to bound it between plus minus five. Um, that sets the color scale uh, manually or automatically. You give it a type one error variable. So you say P less than 0.05 or Q less than 0.05, and it will draw according to that statistic. So it'll only color things that are less than Q less than 0.05 or whatever. And then what's unique about the image reconstruction is you give it this extra variable, which is the power. So one of the issues with image reconstruction is I only have my probe say here, right? So where do I want to show what's a valid image? Well, under the probe, but how do you define under the probe? What about the edge? How close to the edge do you need to be before you're no longer, quote, under the probe? So we compute power which is basically as you move away from the probe, your, your power goes down. And so that effectively this beta term defines kind of the boundaries in which I feel a valid image can be shown. And anything outside of that, that boundary goes to zero. Um, ideally, I should color it like everything outside the boundary is green or something. Um, uh, so it's distinguishable between what is zero because I had no brain activity and what is zero because I couldn't measure there. Um, um, but right now that's what that, that variable stands for. Okay. And then lastly, there's a method that we just added that takes there's the image stats variable and we'll pull out a region of interest. Um, um, so if I say, give me the region of interest stats from the pre-central, uh, sulcus, 
what it'll do is it'll go to this image reconstruction and actually pull out the stats that I, uh, from that particular brain space definition. Um, okay. So that's, that's um, I'm well behind where I want it to be. Uh, no surprise there. Um, but uh, let's, let's try to go through a little bit of this math and I'll try not to make it too painful. So this is basically based on kind of that what we do behind the scenes with the toolbox is based on more or less three papers. So the first paper was this hierarchical Bayesian model. So we already kind of talked about, well, talked about this a little bit in terms of, I have this model set up and I have this tuning parameter, lambda, right? How do I choose lambda? If I choose it too small, it trusts the data too much and I get these infinite solutions. If I make lambda too big, it squashes the solution and my data doesn't matter anymore. It just looks like my prior. And so how do you tune lambda? So there's gotta be a, a, you know, a sensible objective way to tune lambda. So that's what maximum likelihood does is it basically takes a Bayesian approach and makes, um, basically it treats lambda, it says, well, actually the interpretation of lambda is it's actually kind of your signal to noise ratio. And so um, it, it kind of puts that in, in the regularization model, you can have any function you want, any set of lambdas you, you want. It doesn't have to even be real. I mean, it constrains your model. It's prior information. Hopefully it's prior information that you have reason to put in, um, but you wouldn't want to put like a prior, like my brain reconstruction looks like a pattern of a dinosaur or something. You could do it, but it wouldn't make sense, right? In regularization, you could do anything uh, to the cost function like that. In the Bayesian framework, it's all kind of framed in this idea of structured noise and the structured noise in the measurements and the structured noise or uncertainty in the parameter space, in the, in, in the brain space. And so it kind of puts this, this limit on, lambda actually has to be things related to modeling this noise specifically. It can't just be any, any old thing. So um, if you take that though, oops, you can, you can the, the, that Bayesian framework gives you a new cost function that is basically, it's, it's kind of like free energy. So, so it's, it's this idea that you have these terms on the left here, the Y minus H times beta, that's the fit the data part. The beta minus beta naught is the fit my prior part. And um, this notation here, this subscript CN and subscript CP, CP and CN are the noise models. So what it does is it's a weighted average of these and a weighted average of these, depending on what these noise terms are. And then what maximum likelihood does is it extends that cost function with this idea of entropy. So I wanna fit the data um, weighted by the noise, but I, I'm gonna pay a penalty if I, I try to make the noise too small. Um, it's because of the negative log uh, there. And so it's kind of this free energy sort of expression that you have an enthalpy term and you have an entropy term, and you're trying to maximize the free energy of the expression. Um, and so it's a slightly different cost function than you, than you use. But what that allows you to do is you can solve this in sort of an iterative way that you basically take a guess at what your noise is. You solve the model based on that guess of what the noise is. You then go, so you solve the, this part of the equation based on what the noise is. You then go back and assuming I know beta, which I, I just guessed, but assuming that guess was right, this is what CN and CP would be. So you alternate between estimating the parameters and estimating the noise and you go back and forth. And this is how like an OVA works um, and, and, and so on. Um, so, so you basically kind of iterate back and forth, but at the end of the day, you have a single Lambda or set of Lambdas that was determined by your data and this equation of maximum likelihood. So it becomes an objective way to estimate Lambda. What Lambda should I use? The one that maximizes free energy. What is free energy? Go talk to a statistician. Because um, um, I'm, I'm not even perfect at, at, at this. But the idea is you can now take your model and you can say, okay, I've got a noise term for the 830 wavelength. I've got a different noise term for the 690. So I'm gonna have two different lambdas there. 
I'm sorry, it changed to uppercase lambda for some reason. Um, I have in my brain space, I have oxy and deoxy, and oxy has one and deoxy has another. I should actually say oxy deoxy in that space. And so maybe I have four lambdas, one for each wavelength and one for oxy and one for deoxy. Maybe I have another one that models um, a region of interest that I expect to be active. And so I'm gonna throw that in um, as well. And so we throw in all those priors and then fit this maximum likelihood expression that solves for what the lambda should be. I'm gonna skip that. So, so behind the scenes, it's running this, when you give it priors, it's gonna solve uh, kind of the optimal lambda to use for those priors. The second paper that kind of is, is behind the, this, this tool is this group level model. So I mentioned that we don't like to do individual reconstructions. We like to do group reconstructions. The problem is that, um, you know, challenges to group analysis. One, you've got potentially registration issues. So each subject's probe is in a slightly different spot potentially. And you also have individual ana anatomical differences, right? The motor cortex might be in a slightly different orientation to the sensors in this subject than that subject, right? If I, if I did the registration, I might know that, that, that the orientation is different. But what happens is, particularly with a low density probe, like what we see on the top row here, is, so this was a simulation, this was a um, phantom study that Danny Joseph and I did back in, I don't know, 2003-ish maybe. Um, and basically what it is, is we did, uh, um, we had this, this phantom with this, this target that we could pump ink into it. And we moved the target around in the phantom. And you know, if the target was right in between source detectors where our banana functions are, are very strong, we see it, we make measurements and we can reconstruct it into proper brain activity. Here, maybe it's a little bit dim. The, 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 what the ink that was in this didn't change but I got two different answers depending on where it was, you know, in uh, relative to the sensors. And there were some spots that I could put the target, which were basically blind spots to the probe and, and I didn't get any measurements whatsoever. A solution to the inverse model with basically data that's zero is that you could have had activity in some spot that was you were blind to right, that your banana functions didn't crisscross over that area. So, so, so one of the problems with a low density probe is these blind spots mean that I can shift the probe or the image around just a little bit and get a totally different measurement. Um, and, and high density, you don't have that problem. That's kind of the whole point of high density um, is that it creates a more uniform field. So now no matter where the target is, you can find it. Um, but the problem is, I guess probably 90 plus percent of NEARS is operating in this low density right now. So, so um, one of the ideas that we came up with was this idea of group reconstruction. So the idea was that if the brain activity is, let's, let's go back to here. If the brain activity is, you know, I, I have this target moving around, I have these three measurements, and um, basically it's, let's find a estimate of how much ink I had in that target um, or the amplitude of that target that's consistent with all four of these images, right? And, and so, so the idea is, although it's in a blind spot here, I can inform it with the other, the other sets of data. And so I can use all my other subjects as a prior on, you know, I can use nine of my 10 subjects as a prior to solve for the temp subject. Because although it's got it, that one subject has an infinite number of solutions to the problem, only a subset, an infinite subset, but only a subset of that was consistent with the nine other subjects as well. And so you're trying to find something that's consistent with between all of your imager constructions at the same time. And so the idea of what we do is we use this concept in FreeSurfer which is that my brain is aligned between the different, um, when I segment it, I get this registered cortical space. And so what that means is if you look in FreeSurfer and you pick a, um, a continent here, so we've got Africa, and you fold Africa, you fold the brain up into um, the cortical space, 
you see that that's actually the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex in each subject. The gyral folding pattern is slightly different. The anatomy is slightly different. The registration in, in Euclidean space, in, in true space, is slightly different. But I've registered it in this registered surface space that this brain region here, this, the set of parameters that would be read in this space, corresponds to the dorsolateral prefrontal in every subject. And so the idea here is that we can actually, if we, we have this kind of registration concept, I can define a different mesh, a different brain model for each subject. I can say this, this subject's brain was a little bit more wrinkled than that subject's brain. And I can put that in to solve the Jacobian, the Ford model. But then when I go and I estimate my parameters, I'm estimating in a space that this one parameter corresponds to the exact same anatomy in each subject, despite the fact that the anatomy might be in a slightly different position in the head and different relative to the sensors. So, so, so what we do is, in that sense, we solve the, the group level model as part of the image reconstruction. We try to find an image that's also consistent with all of the, your subjects, um, rather than doing you know, 10 individual reconstructions and then averaging them together, we try to find the one reconstruction that solved all 10 of your subjects simultaneously, treating subject as a random effect, okay? And so, so, so just from that paper, here's an example. If you take those five subjects that kind of the anatomy is slightly different, you do five individual reconstructions, you get, you know, a lot of variability. This subject, that anatomy, happened to be in a blind spot for this probe. So I reconstructed it and it really wasn't a great um, uh, measurement because it was in a blind spot. But if you reconstruct it all together, that one subject that had a blind spot, well, his data based on the other subjects is, you know, this data is consistent with the activity being in that blind spot because the other four subjects supported putting the activity right here. And it's not, it's, it's consistent with the data. That is, it wasn't a blind spot for that subject based on their forward model and their registration. So we're able to separate that out and get a much stronger, much more consistent answer in the random effects space. Both this solution, or let's say this solution and this solution, both model the data. That subject number four, their data, this would, this one and this one was perfectly valid solution. That is, it fit the data um, for that subject. But this solution down here was more consistent with the other subjects. And that's kind of the distinction. So just kind of showing that average, when you average your five images, you get a much blurry image, blurred image compared to solving it all together. You increase your effect size by roughly 3% or threefold rather which means you need nine times less subjects to, to, to get the, the power for the analysis. Um, so, 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 so that was the second paper. So step number one is we're using this maximum likelihood to figure out the lambda, right? We're finding lambda in a data-driven way. Model number two, method number two, is we're, we're incorporating group level in our, in our model so that we can actually directly um, um, uh, so that we, we can take advantage of the fact that the subjects are slightly different. The third approach that we take in here is that we do surface-based smoothing. So the motivation for this is that actually, even if you look at MRI or anatomy, you find that most of your blood vessels are actually on the surface of the brain. So when we measure MRI, for example, even though MRI is a volumetric method, you actually see that MRI follows the, is mostly on the, the, the cortical layer, is mostly in that cortical surface. Um, and so it would be reasonable, given that NIRS has no sensitivity to the deeper regions, to basically just kind of approximate it as a surface image, uh, do topography, that is 2D reconstruction rather than 3D reconstruction. But the idea of topography is that it's actually, it's a 2D surface that's kind of folded up. So it's, a, it's what's called a manifold. It's, it's, it, but it's still a surface, it's not a volume. 
And so we introduced this idea of uh, diffuse optical topography as 2D reconstruction of brain activity. And that's, that's what my toolbox does. Now, when you're on the surface, you can do tricks like this. And so that's, sorry, we can, we, in that paper, we introduced this idea of wavelets. So the idea of a wavelet is it's a space, it's a, it's a space and spatial frequency. And so if we take something like the earth here, for example, we can take the earth and we can actually express it as the whole earth is a linear combination of these wavelets. So this is what the first wavelet of the earth looks like. This is what the second wavelet. And if I added all these up together, I would have gotten that image, right? So with the entire basis set, I can get a perfect reconstruction of that surface. If I go back and I only use 50% of the wavelets, I use the first half of the data, um, I can actually get something that still looks really good, right? You'd probably be hard pressed to find differences. Um, it's probably Pittsburgh. I'm guessing Pittsburgh dropped off uh, the map because um, that would be my luck here. But um, that's where I am, by the way. I should have premised with that joke. It doesn't work as well over Zoom, I guess. Okay. Um, anyway. What is wrong with me? Um, okay, so, 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 so anyway, so we can, one of the properties of wavelets is that you can actually do compression that by using only the first couple, you can actually model a, a good chunk of the data with less degrees of freedom. So on the one hand, it's a way to reduce that parameter space where I said it was underdetermined. We had way more parameters than we did measurements. Well, we can use these wavelets to basically reduce the number of parameters that we care about. And we're doing it in a way that um, uh, has information about the surface. And so uh, what we do is we take that 3D brain, that free surfer brain, and we can model it as wavelets. So this is what the first wavelet of the brain looks like. This is what the fifth, you know, five levels of wavelets uh, look like in the brain. And so we can go and we can, we can uh, and as you, as you go up, you get better resolution. So let's just look at point spread function using five wavelets looks like this. Uh, so five wavelets looks like that. Four wavelength banks would look like this. Three would look like that. Two would look like that. One would look like that. Um, but you see degrees of freedom. I have 200 degrees of freedom in this. I have... 800 in this, I should have 3,200. So it should go up by a factor of four each bank, uh, the way that we do it. Um, and so maybe, you know, yours is probably somewhere between here and here, or well, actually somewhere between two and four, maybe even, right? In terms of we have about, um, so this is 250 square millimeters, I'm drawing a blank what that would be, 2.5 square centimeters, I guess. Um, um, of resolution, which is probably about where our probe is. And so the idea is that we can use this as a way of spatially smoothing. But it's not just smoothing in volume space, it's actually smoothing in surface space, which means that if you look at this on the brain, what you see is you're smoothing along the gyri, that the motor cortex, positions on the motor cortex are much closer to each other in surface space then the motor cortex is to the, uh, the, the sensory cortex. So to go from M1 to S1, you actually had to go down and come back up, which is a lot farther distance to travel than it was in the 3D space. Going across the gyri, staying on the motor cortex and walking along the ridge is a lot closer in surface space than jumping over gyri. And so basically what this does is this allows us kind of we're doing smoothing, but it's more likely that it would be a single gyrus with a lot of activity than it would be to be two neighboring gyri, okay? So you'll actually see that this approach allows us to actually get, um, we have new data that I'm not, I don't have here where we can actually differentiate sensory and motor activity um, to gyri that were really close, you know, half a uh, centimeter and a half apart from each other, but we can actually distinguish which one was involved in the task because we're using information about the anatomy uh, in our reconstructions. Okay, so back to this slide, right? So when you set up your job for the mixed effects model, you're set, or for the image reconstruction, you're setting this mixed effects part. 
this part sets up that group level model. Each subject is a random effect in my group that I'm going to take each subject's uh, data and trying to find a solution that was consistent with the whole thing, right? But if we're doing that, we might as well support the ability to put in things like age or other demographics. So you specify a formula here the same way you do the mixed effects in channel space. Only what it's doing is it's incorporating that formula into the image reconstruction. Uh, just like the channel space, um, you probably want to use dummy encoding, uh, so full dummy encoding, and whether or not you want to center your variables. Like, so if you have age as a demographic, whether you want to solve absolute age or mean zero, you know, the average age, so you mean center that variable before you feed it in. So that's what this set of parameters deals with. If you only wanted to do single subject reconstruction, you would say beta uh, tilde negative one plus condition, and you would leave everything else off because you only have one subject, or if you didn't have a group and, and so on. The second part here is where you're specifying that unique Jacobian and probe registration for each subject. And so if I happen to know that my probe is registered differently, or I happen to know that the anatomy is different, right? I can put in the Ford solution for that subject. That's that, I said it was a dictionary. And if you said default, it uses it for anything that's undefined. It, but if you put the actual subject's name in there, it'll use that Ford model for that subject. So what it's doing is it's, when it sets up that group level model, it's using a different Jacobian for each subject's part of that model. The last one here, the, the next one here is the smoothing basis. So, so you give it, as I said, a, a, a single mesh that you're gonna do your reconstruction on. So you pick one of your subjects that you wanna show the data, whoever had the prettiest brain that you wanna show the data on, but it's actually reconstructing using the individual brains. And then that concept of free surfer of, this point is actually right over here in this other subject and, and they're all registered so I can transfer what anatomy uh, what a brain region looked like in each subject differently, but I have to pick one subject to show you. Um, the basis set here uh, in nears.inverse.basis in that folder, there's a couple of basis sets. The default is actually an identity operator, which is not doing any smoothing, but there's a wavelet, there's, there's nears.inverse.basis or nears inverse basis wavelets, which does that wavelet approach. Um, your model the mesh has to be set up to be consistent with the wavelets, but if you're using the free surfer stuff, it's already it's it's taken care of in that. If you're using the SBM stuff, uh, the wavelets won't work because uh, the models are not set up exactly right. And I'm I'm working on that, but right now it should work with the free surfer to put in the, the wavelet basis. There's also a basis dot Gaussian, which just does a Gaussian smoothing. Um, so you specify a full width half max of that smoothing kernel in. I forget if it's millimeters or centimeters, but you specify the smoothing and it just does a Gaussian basis, but it's smoothing on the surface. So it still has this property of going down the gyra and coming back up and it's more favorable to smooth along the surface. Okay. And the last parameters, set of parameters here, this mask and priors, that's where you would put these concepts of, um, so you can put in, if you had a region of interest that you thought might be involved in the task, you can put it into this priors field. And what it'll do is it'll add it to that hierarchical model and throw a lambda on it and solve for that lambda based on that maximum likelihood expression. So you can actually introduce additional priors in this way too. Um, the default is basically it does um, that minimum norm, which is I, I expect all the parameters to be close to zero. Um, and so it, so it puts in that kind of standard um, Lambda times beta, beta minus beta naught squared, where beta naught is zero. I expect it to be close, uh, a very small solution. But you can put in other priors in this. And you can put in multiple priors in this because the maximum likelihood expression can support solving for multiple uh, hyperparameters within there. OK. Um, guys, Nerex team, I'm, I have a lot of slides left. I'm not going to get to them. Uh, do you think it's better to go, I can briefly introduce, I can probably do it in under 10 minutes uh, to go through all the multimodal stuff, 
or I can just give a preview, like a one minute version and go to talks, uh, go to questions. What do you think is best? Hey, I did. Um, maybe you can give um, just a two minute version. small version. Yeah, and then we go to the talks and maybe we can do a, another more through so webinar on the multimodal part. So we have yeah. you know, these different things. Okay, well, the, the two minute elevator pitch uh, very slow elevator of, of, of this, right? So we are, we, we've already gone through this, the nearest inverse model, right? Brain space to channel space, ill-posed, undetermined, yada, yada, a lot of equations, right? But we also have a model that's very similar in fMRI, right? We don't tend to think of it that way, but we have this fMRI bold is proportional to the deoxyhemoglobin. This proportionality constant lambda here, we don't really know. It depends on a lot of these baseline properties, but um, we have this relationship of near or MRI signal is a measure of deoxyhemoglobin. And so the idea, this is kind of an old paper at this point, was you put these both together and just like we did the group level imagery construction, now we're doing a multimodal imagery construction. Find the image of oxy and deoxy that was consistent with both the fMRI and the NIRS. And so we can put that in and we can solve a joint reconstruction model that estimates oxy-deoxy from my multimodal set of data. Um, this is a bit of an old uh, uh, slide. We can use REML for, for or the maximum likelihood methods for this now. So the expression is a little bit different, but the whole idea is you have noise that's unique to NIRS noise that's unique to the fMRI, and those are hyperparameters in there that you can solve the lambdas for, okay? So if you do that, you can end up with something like this where, so here's the image on the left is fMRI by itself. Here's the image of the fusion reconstruction. They look almost the same um, spatially, um, but this one's red, this one's blue. That's because this is a percent signal change, arbitrary units, and this one's actually micromolar. Deoxy goes down. Um, and likewise, I have an oxy image that's not quite as good spatially, but by constraining the deoxyhemoglobin, you also constrained a lot of the oxyhemoglobin image as well. And so the oxyhemoglobin, despite the fact that fMRI had no information about deoxyhemoglobin, it actually does help the nearest reconstruction of oxyhemoglobin as, as well. Okay. And in this paper, we kind of showed by doing this reconstruction, we got roughly the spatial resolution of fMRI, but the temporal resolution of NIRS and the calibrated uh, efficiency of, of that neither one had. So a couple of years later now, with the, we've put into the toolbox a little bit more generic approaches for this, where um, it does it in that REML framework so we can take, say, EEG and NIRS and create a joint forward operator like that and actually solve for joint image reconstruction of NIRS and EEG. I think that's actually a demo that's in the, the toolbox. Um, but this is the idea of EEG alone. EEG has low spatial resolution, even by NIRS standards. Um, e NIRS alone, a little bit more localized. When you do the fusion, uh, you end up trying to find the solution that was consistent with both. And consistent with both statistically, because I, unlike MRI, I don't have that relationship of old signal is directly deoxyhemoglobin. This is putting it in as off diagonals in the covariance matrix. That is, statistically, I kind of think that EEG should be in about the same space, same position as the NIRS. Um, and so you can put in that, I think that's a statistical truth and you solve for lambda based on the data. So if your data supported that, lambda would be zero or non-zero. If that assumption, EEG just was not consistent with that assumption, the, the maximum likelihood model would have um, uh, brought that term down to zero and say it's not, your data is not consistent with that. Um, so one of the nice things about the maximum likelihood that we showed in the paper um, that we, we published a long time ago is that if you put in bad information, it doesn't destroy the model. Like I have two regions of interest, one was correct and one was not. What happens is the region of interest that was not consistent with the data, the model figures out to make that lambda zero. So don't trust that information, that prior was bad, trust this prior information. And in the same way in the multimodal is you can make suggestions 
that NEARS and EEG um, are in the same spot and let the model figure out how important that suggestion was. I realize that anyone in the audience that's a Bayesian statistician is cringing at my use of the word suggestion as a proxy for priors, but that's okay. Um, you know, and, and we've since then been able to pull out all the stops. We had a paper a couple of years ago where basically we used all the tools that are I described in the nearest toolbox, right? We did individual reconstructions of their anatomy. We use that anatomy in this group level model, um, and et cetera, et cetera. We used wavelets. It's, um, and this is the result. This was, we brought a bunch of people in. We recorded median nerve in the MRI with NEARS. We actually did NEARS, EEG, and MRI at the same time. And then we took them into the MEG scanner. MEG measures neural activity like EEG, but it's, it's, a, it's a magnetic field thing. And we measured simultaneously NEARS MEG. So we had NEARS MEG and NEARS fMRI and same task. And we can actually look at the comparison of reconstructions. And you can actually see that uh, NEARS uh, was, is doing you know, almost as well as the fMRI. Um, um, in terms of our reconstruction, we're actually able to get it to the right gyrus. Uh, so, so we're able to get it to the somatosensory rather than uh, I guess that would be the motor. I'm a little bit misoriented in how my brain is looking right here. Um, but that's kind of the pulling out all the stops. All the tools that are in the toolbox can make this these images like this. Um, I'll skip that. Um, just kind of point out stuff that um, still in the toolbox or issues still. Um, I, as I said, I need a more generalized way. Oops, a more generalized way to bring subject information in. Um, a lot of our free surfer and stuff is based on this is the way I run free surfer, but we've encountered people that run it slightly different. Um, and so if you have trouble with that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for more general ways to bring it in to make it more useful for people. Um, um, one of the problems we still have with the stats is statistics in image space is not trivial. Um, and we're, we are aware that we currently have a a uh, rather large type one error control problem. So that is we have a lot of false positives in the image space. Um, um, so we've spent a lot of time in channel space with this idea of get the stats right. So if we plot, you know, what we do simulations and we plot what the p-value was expected to be versus what it actually was, it's this nice straight line that you're getting back exactly when I report 0.05, if you did a simulation, you really do expect 5% false positives. Um, in the image reconstruction, if I say, you know, if the code says 5%, um, it might be something more like 10 or 20% false positives. So it's an uncontrolled type one error that we really haven't figured out how to solve in image reconstruction space. So, 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 um, just take the P values with a grain of salt, I guess. Um, and then also in the toolbox, we have extensions. So if you've ever looked around, you see that there's actually a folder called EEG and there's you always use nears dot, but there's actually an EEG dot modules dot whatever um, that lets you do all this analysis for EEG. That's kind of what supports the multimodal stuff is we have nears and EEG in the same toolbox. Um, but we also have this, this extension called DT series, which is a dense time series, which is basically if I did a reconstruction, I now have a movie of the brain acti the activity on the surface of the brain. And this this extension allows you to bring EEG, MEG, fMRI, and NEARS all into the exact same space and has modules and tools and stuff for dealing with it in that space. Um, that's a lot of stuff that's under um, construction and, and work in progress, but I'm happy to talk to people about what's in there already. Um, and then finally, I know I'm jumping around here, um, there are a lot of better image reconstruction uh, models out there. Uh, so I have a grad student or postdoc right now who's working on a group level group lasso problem that tries to um, you know, basically cluster like, hey, these voxels were part of the motor cortex. So they're probably more likely to cluster together than these voxels uh, that were not part of the motor cortex. And so it kind of introduces this idea of region of interest grouping as, as, a, um, as a parameter in, in the model. Um, Anyway, I'll stop there because that's the end of my talk. And if there's questions, 
Perfect. Hey, hi. Thank you very much for the talk, Ted. As usual, super interesting. I guess everyone is more interested on the multimodal part now, but uh, oh. <laughs> <maybe> later. <laughs> Jump back to some of those. If, uh... Yeah. Um, so if, if we want to see everyone again, you can go to the gallery mode again. I mean, uh, for the talk, Amy Pin, uh, just and Hubbard, but if you want to see each other. Um, Okay, so we do have some questions already that were posted yeah. here in the in the box. Um, let's start with them, and then we can go to some that we received earlier uh, during the registration. I am not sure. Um, we would like to make this as um, interactive as possible. So, if you would like to ask your question to Ted directly, uh, we encourage you to do that. Uh, first question we have here is from Addison Billing. I don't know if you would like to make your question. I'm also happy to read it, no problem. Okay, I will read it then. Hi. Ah, oh, you're there, hi. good, yeah. go on. Um, I was wondering why you are dealing with short channels in the forms of using them as regressors within the channel space for your subject level and then feeding it into the group level imagery construction instead of handling it then. Well, so you could have you could have done it either way. So, so if you um, the short set, so 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 my imagery construction tools are older than my short separation stuff. So when I wrote a lot of this imagery construction papers, it was like 2010 ish. So we didn't, as a field, didn't really have this concept of short separation at the time. Um, I don't know which is better. You can do it either way. You could do put your short separation into the GLM model, remove it at the channel space, you have cleaned data that goes to the image reconstruction. And so the short separation is gone after you finish the stats, which mm -hmm. is kind of the way it looks right now. Or yeah. you could have just left it, all the short separation in there. So your stats, your GLM in the channel space is gonna have a bit more global response, but then you let the image reconstruction take care of it. Um, that you maybe have a skin layer that has lower spatial resolution than a, um, a brain layer. Um, mm. Either approach would work. Um, I think you can, you can, could actually, um, with a little bit of tweaking, I think you can do both in the toolbox. Um, the, the one that I'm not entirely sure is, um, I'm trying to think how to specify different resolutions of a mesh for the skin versus the brain. Um, yeah. We have a paper that did that, but I don't know if that's necessarily in the toolbox. But you could have done it either way, and it's an interesting think, question of which yeah, is Yeah, I want to grab the, the first two components. I have like about a thousand short channels, so I wouldn't want to use all of them as regressors. Mm -hmm. um, so just grabbing yeah the first two components within imagery construction, I think would make a lot of sense to do it that way. So, so, so the um, in that. We have a paper that's on short separation that basically mm -hmm. looked at email space, what's the best way to do it. Yeah. We did have, I don't remember if it's in the paper or it's just one of the many methods we tried that didn't work. Um, but we actually did an image reconstruction model as part of that. So staying in channel space, but I'm regressing it kind of with this image reconstruction idea that, mm -hmm. you know, here's actually the relationship between the short separation, that channel and the ones around it rather than a short separation kind of over here in the brain contributing to the GLM over there. It was more, you know, biologically yeah. using the Ford model. That did not work nearly as well as the, just throw them all in as, a, as regressors directly, no matter where they came from. Really? Uh, so, so, but that, that was one of it, I was surprised too. <laughs> yeah. so, well, but that's why we investigated because I thought that was going to be a better method. Uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely more but it, it didn't work as well. So whether that's a, you could take that and tweak it and make it work or um, it just really doesn't work. I'm not entirely sure. I'm happy to share. I think the code's actually in the toolbox still. Um, it's under advanced.nearest.modules. Oh, I'll um, find out. I'll look at that now. Thanks. But any other? Thank you. Um, we have one other, Arun. Yeah, yes. I can ask that, yep. Uh, so I was wondering whether we can adapt this Bitcoin module to the resting state of the connectivity analysis. So, so um, 
you can't you cannot do reconstruction of functional connectivity in the same like the same way you would do a GLM, m right because it's channel yeah. to channel so you can't just um what you do in eeg or meg for mm -hmm. this problem is you take the time course of oxy deoxy or of optical density or whatever you reconstruct it as a movie so you now have voxels by time it's this giant matrix a kind of dynamic yeah, and then you do your you do your connectivity in that space. Okay. Um, so we can actually do that, and that's that part of the toolbox that I described the DT series. There's a uh, there's a method in there that instead of reconstructing st a stats model, will actually reconstruct a movie. So it takes a time course and turns it into a movie, and mm -hmm. then you can take that movie and do the connectivity for one brain region to an, to another. I, I'm not entirely sure that all those methods work in the toolbox. As I said, that that little subset of the toolbox is things we're working on in progress. But that's how I think you would do it. And that's how they do it in EEG, MEG. Okay. Now, when you do the stats, you have to be careful. So in, like in EEG, MEG, they do um, like permutation testing because two neighboring voxels in brain space came from the same source detector pair. And so they're going to be core. So there's, it's kind of invalid to look at connectivity in kind of a point spread function around each channel. Um, and so they, there's methods in EEG or MEG that deal with that. And how do you kind of correct that? Or how do you, how do you know if it's a valid statistical comparison to be making? Um, and that's, I, that's definitely not in the toolbox. And you'd have to do that if you wanted to pull any stats out of your connectivity in that space. But okay. I think the most of the elements to do what you're asking for are already there um, okay. with this concept of DT series. Thank you. Yep. Perfect. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Ted. Um, we have one more question from Yvonne. I'm... Yeah. Yes, I can ask it. Um, I've got anatomical uh, scans. Uh, T1 scans of my participants. And I've been trying to do the forward model. So I have done the forward models, I've done the free surfer, the image okay. set works, but then when I get to the draw function, that part doesn't work because it seems to create a sort of drawing of the activation for each individual subject and tries to over overlap them, but that doesn't work. And in one of the demos, um, you mentioned that you should project them to normal space before you do the forward models or before you do the image reconstructions, but I like is well, that possible so, so, to so, do that? So in, in FreeSurfer, you know, so if you're using my code to kind of pull the right files from, from FreeSurfer, uh, if you take the recon all function in FreeSurfer through the fourth stage, it's doing the registration of that cortical surface. So now if you take the you know, peel uh, variable, so the peel surface in freezer from one subject and another subject, um, there, there's a correspondence between you know, this vertex is the same as this vertex there. Um, and that's how we can, so if you're using the freezer for this idea that you can have a common parameter space despite different anatomy should already kind of be in there. Um, it sounds, it really sounds like something's maybe a bug in my code somewhere. And this is where, you know, you might use a slightly different flag in FreeSurfer that I don't use and yeah. I haven't figured it out yet. So if um, I would suggest, you know, um, follow up with this, maybe send, we might have to get your data in some form and take yeah, a look at I what's happening that. with that, um, if, if that can be shared or some way to reproduce it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, can it's, I would also say, that that as I was preparing the talk last night, you know, um, that I did encounter a couple of bugs with some of the stuff that I'm going to fix. Um, so, okay. so it's, it's my, 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 my one student who did a bunch of imagery construction stuff to add some, some stuff. Um, uh, there might've been some things that we broke when we added new stuff. So. Okay. I'll keep an eye out and I'll contact you as well. So I can always share some data. Sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Is we, there any questions from that earlier email set that you um, gave me? That yes, 
let's go before we continue. Let's go. Let's some, just run here. Mo yeah, most of the questions though were were addressed during the talk. Um, there, there is yeah, there's there's a question in the chat here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, From Edward, I guess. Yeah, I can ask it if you want. Um, I was wondering, especially uh, when you talked about uh, image fusion uh, later with EEG NIRS, mm -hmm. uh, because usually uh, we only do source reconstruction in EEG when we have uh, quite a high density EEG, but it's difficult yeah. to mix with NIRS. So usually we will have more sparse montage. So mm -hmm. how much EEG is needed uh, to bring good information to the NIRS uh, source reconstruction? So, so that that data I showed was a 32 channel brain vision EEG system. Um, and we've done it there, but if, if I'm not gonna pull up, but what, what you probably noticed was that my NIRS only was better than my NIRS plus EEG for the NIRS part. EEG mm -hmm. got better, but NIRS got worse. Um, um, and that's exactly as you point out, the EEG just really doesn't have the spatial resolution that most people don't do image recon with you know, only 32 channels. Um, you know, and as you point out, if you have a high density, you know, the, you know, uh, hydro net or, or something, you know, high density EEG system, it's really hard to get your mirrors in there. Um, and so there's gotta be somewhere in the middle that is kind of, is, is happier. Um, in the toolbox, I'm trying to think what's still in there. There's in the demos folder, there's an example, uh, a bunch of examples. So it's demos slash examples. And that's where I started to throw some of the stuff like the multimodal. Um, and there should be some multimodal code that actually looks at, it draws the point spread function for, if I do image reconstruction with NIRS or EEG, this is what my point spread function is. And this is what my point spread function with a joint reconstruction is. And so I bet you could probably use those tools to try to answer that question of what's the trade-off of, you know, if I add more EEG, that means it's taking up space and it's more, so what, where actually is the, you know, the practical way I should set this up. Um, but we've only dealt with low density EEG um, at the moment. I don't know if that answered so, the question. Um, yes. So when you talk also about fusion in, uh, NIRS fMRI, was it simultaneously? Because we might think uh, also to have identity EEG and identity NIRS in separate session yeah. and then do fusion. What do you think of that? It, it depends on how you're dealing with the image reconstruction. So if you deal with it as a statistical thing, like we are actually for the EEG and the NIRS, there's actually no, um, so we're, we're taking all our data in NIRS losing the time series because we're going to a statistical channel-based model. We're doing the same thing with ERPs in the EEG and then we're doing an ERP versus HRF kind of reconstruction mm -hmm. statistic. So in that sense, we've lost all of our time series information prior to that. So there's no utility in, there's nothing that's assuming that those had to have been collected at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, so, so if it's purely a statistical, I expect the EEG to be in the same, roughly the same place as the EEG or the NIRS, mm -hmm. then I think you don't actually have, you don't benefit from doing it simultaneously. If you're trying to do a reconstruction um, and it's more like the fMRI NIRS fusion one that we did them concurrently, we actually end up with that that's it's a little bit different than how I described it, but I didn't want to go into those details. But what we're doing is we're using the NIRS at 10 hertz and the fMRI at a half hertz. And basically the image is constrained every two seconds with the fMRI, but the gaps are filled in temporally with the NIRS. And so in that case, we actually do need it to be truly simultaneous because we're actually making sort of a high temporal resolution movie um, and trying to infer things from that. So it depends on kind of what the point, the, uh, the goal is, but you can use the fusion methods either way, if it's simultaneous or, or, or not. Um, so. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, we just have, I guess, one more question from that came before during the registration, more about high density data and large data sets, if it would still 
be you know possible to use this uh, type of image reconstruction with a it, it, in principle um it shouldn't so we've done reconstruction with high density um like um yeah it, it high density reconstruct image reconstruction works a lot better than low density um the the kind of the idea with like the group level model for example um, doing it as a group level model is a major improvement on low density systems. It's a minor improvement on high density because the high density was good to begin with. And so mm -hmm. adding this additional, uh, you know, group information made it better, but not by, you know, just not dramatically. Uh, whereas the low density, it's a pretty dramatic effect when you're in a blind spot versus, versus not. Um, so the tools will work right now as is, knock on wood, with uh, high density systems. Um, with that said, I've never tried to take, you know, a, um, um, you know, some of these systems have 60,000 measurements channels and tried to do a reconstruction, I might run out of memory. Um, but in principle, the math is the same. Um, yeah, I guess more, more on the processing side then. Okay, um, do we have any more questions here? I don't think so. Anyone from the audience would still like to ask a question? Um, if I can, uh, I have a second question, but I don't want to ask too much. It's okay. Um, so uh, I was wondering about the forward uh, model and source reconstruction. So uh, when we do simulation, we have uh, MCXR provide us uh, information in the volume space we have. Uh, but uh, when you show reconstruction, you show on the cortical surface. So how you transform volume data to cortical surface? Uh, so, so, so if de it depends on which Ford model you're, you're using. So, so if, if you're using uh, the approximate slab or the near fast BAM, there are already surface uh, representations. If you're using NearFast, the FEM models or um, mesh-based Monte Carlo, those guys, they're in volume space. And what we do is, um, so, so your Jacobian, let's make it up, will have, I don't know, 60,000 points on it, which are three-dimensional points. They're, they're in volume space. So there's a, there's a field called mask that the, the, the job takes. And what, what I would do if I wanted to do reconstruction only using the surface points is of those, however many I said, 30,000, actually only 5,000 are on the surface. And so I'd basically make the mask zeros and ones to pick out what are the surface points versus the non-surface points. That made sense. Yes. Uh, or you can do take your finite L, you can take your Jacobian and you can just extract the surface points and evaluate um, the fluence of the Jacobian through those surface points and then put that in as, as the Jacobian. Um, generally with the image reconstruction, I have to think now, I, I've almost always because used the near fast BEM uh, code. Um, it should work with, yeah. It's been a because while what, since I used the What we do in storm is uh, we project uh, the volume data in the cortical surface. Mm -hmm. So you reconstruct in volume space and then you force it into the cort cortex space afterwards. But your um, parameter. No, we, we project the forward model to the. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I, th I think that's, that's, that's how we deal with it when it's in the finite element, the volumetric code, where I said you evaluate the Jacobian, the fluence through the surface. I think that's the, similar to what you're, you're saying. If we project the forward model onto the cortical surface. But yeah, I read an article where they were doing the opposite. They were reconstructing in the volume space and then projecting. But I was wondering what was the best. Uh, I'm not sure. So, so, so in the, that, that paper, which is Abdenor and, and, and Hopper, the uh, surface topography image reconstruction paper, we, we, uh, we do have the, you know, what does this look like with a 3D reconstruction versus a 2D reconstruction? So the problem with 3D reconstruction, right? You have a lot more variables mm -hmm. um, and there's actually something nice about the topography that you're going from a 2D source detector space to another 2D, you know, topography space. And 
that actually, um, I don't know how to describe it. it you know, it, that, that actually constrains the problem more than you would expect. Um, that our solutions in that topography space are a lot more stable than the solutions in volume space. Um, so, so I would imagine doing the Ford model into surface space and then doing the reconstruction there where you kind of automatically have less parameters is probably a lot more stable than reconstructing in volume space, taking the solution and then projecting it onto the mm -hmm. surface. I think going to the surface directly is probably better, but I don't have the analytic um, okay. figures to back that statement up. So. Okay. Um, I guess that at this point, do you still have one? Sorry, I have, I have, um, are you planning on doing any of the DCM work in the image space or how would you, if you were trying to do that, like how would you interface it? With other toolboxes, if it wasn't possible to do it with an analyzer. So, so, so uh, it, again, in that uh, dense time series, uh, the DT series, kind of where we take our nearest data and we put it into that, we can export it then as a SIFTI file, which all the the like the uh, work human connectome project workbench works on um, SIFTI, SIFTI files. Okay. Um, and so you could actually start to use a lot of the tools for fMRI and stuff once you're in that space. Um, I haven't thought about like DCM in, I, I haven't thought about DCM in image space. I haven't thought about a lot of analysis in image space because right now, honestly, we're trying to solve some of the stats problems of when you do an image reconstruction you know, how do you trust your, your, you said we have a type one error control issue right now. And, and stuff like that. so we're trying to kind of like get better imaging um, and more, more confident in our stats in the image space before we start doing a lot with it. Like, you know, secondary analysis like DCM or connectivity and stuff. But um, again, if you go through that SIFTI or that dense time series part of the toolbox, you should be able to export to something that a lot of the fMRI readers can use. Um, okay. I know I've I know I've done it. I just haven't done it for a while, uh, so that that part of the code might be a little bit outdated. But um, and that, if you well, if you want to try it, go ahead and let me know how it works. And if it if it's not working, um, I'm I'm happy to take a look and see if I can fix it because I want it working. Um, so cool. Thank you. Yep. That would be very interesting, did. Okay. Um, I guess no more questions. Oh, okay, Ted, thank you very much. As usual, it was really, really nice having you here. A um, lot of compliments in the chat and in the emails. Hey, hi, Felipe, you want to make a question or? Okay. No, I just wanted to show his face, <laughs> smile. Yeah, so, thank yeah, you no, very much for awesome. being here. So. so, all right. Good, thank you. See you in your next webinar. <laughs>